Okay, class. All right, class. Okay, please take a seat. We're going to go ahead and get started. I can't think of a better way to spend the time when the weather is so rotten outside than to be with each other and, you know, warm and well fed and everybody's uh, seeming pretty content. So, this is going to be a great evening despite what's going on out there. I'm Gleaves Whitney. I direct the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University. And I am just so happy to welcome you here. Uh, there are people that I want to thank right off the bat who help make programs like this possible. First of all, I want to thank our partners with the Hallenstein Center for tonight's event. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Noreen Myers. Noreen, are you near? There you are, Noreen. Would you please raise your hand to give Noreen a hand? Noreen comes to us from the Progressive Women's Alliance, and she has just been a great supporter of our efforts in our Common Ground Initiative year in and year out. She, in fact, it was our conversation at Charlie's Crab, which really launched this years ago. And then um, Annette Kirk from the Russell Kirk Center for Cultural Renewal. Annette, where are you? I want to recognize you, Annette. Well, let's give her a hand anyway. Annette's also been part of this shindig from the get-go, so we're really pleased to have our partners. Uh, I also want to thank all the speakers who've come in under, in some cases, some pretty, well, not you, Karen, but in some places from some pretty hazardous conditions to get to us. I know our, our main speaker had to come from a place that was really transitioning to, to uh, bad weather, so we're glad that Mark and all of you are here. Thank you for being here and being supportive. Um, you know, we worked really hard to bring together speakers who would really contribute to today's debate in a sense that gets away. Well, now there's Annette. Hi, Annette. I just recognized you. Uh, yeah, well, you can pray. Yeah, go ahead. Great. You know, in a way that, that takes our civil discourse to a much better level than what we are treated to usually on uh, cable TV. It takes effort, it takes commitment, a real sense, I think a, an emotional intelligence as well as a willingness to engage intellectually in sometimes very difficult situations. So I appreciate the speaker's dispositions coming here to do that. Now we've, we've selected our speakers very carefully from the right and from the left, from the conservative tradition, from the liberal progressive tradition and other traditions. And I can tell you, after they've had a few drinks, they're all the same. <laughs> Let me just tell you a word or two about the Howenstein Center and what we're about. We do several things at the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies. As the name implies, we're a Presidential Studies Center. You know, the constellation of the stars right now mean that a lot of people want to talk about the presidency. Whatever else you think of the current president of the United States, business has been great around here at the Presidential Studies Center because people want to know more about the institution of the presidency. And I've said to people all along, we're seeing such a resurgence in interest in all of our institutions. This is a good thing, folks. As an educator, I'm totally behind that. Then the uh, second thing we do, we're a leadership academy. We have about 60 to 70 students who come to us. Uh, every year, we try to give them 60 to 70 hours of instruction about what ethical, effective, civil leadership looks like. And uh, we've, uh, Chad Dowding, are you here? Uh, he's done a great job running our Cook Leadership Academy. Couldn't be more proud of those young people and their eagerness because like the presidency, another topic that is on people's minds, the quality of leadership. What, kind, what kinds of leaders do we want reflecting us as a people? It's an urgent question that's being asked. And so uh, the Leadership Academy tries to be a center of leadership excellence here in the Midwest. Speaking of Midwest, talk about the constellation. When John Lauk and I started hosting Midwestern conferences, we had no idea the role the Midwest would play in 2016. And now we are running a Midwestern conference where, get this, we're going to have 150 presenters from universities around the country and some Canada. 
So we're really pleased that we can be a center for West Midwestern studies and really a revival of Midwestern scholarship, which had been neglected because of globalization for so many decades. And people are rediscovering the Midwest and its importance as now we know from, uh, you know, just our, our elections. And then finally, why we're here this evening. Common ground. This is an initiative that goes back a uh, number of years. We launched it many years ago with a National Endowment for the Humanities grant. In fact, we launched two programs with NEH grants. And we've been able, I think, to, to make inroads. We're the only institution, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, because many of you come from other institutions. We're the only institution in the United States, to my knowledge, that invites progressives and conservatives, or wherever you want to label yourself, to come to our stage and be in dialogue with each other. And if you're self-consciously progressive, say, self-consciously conservative, you are probably in a situation right now where you're redefining, helping redefine your tradition along with other public intellectuals. Well, we're interested in that redefinition. What does it look like, you know, given what has happened in the last two decades in American politics? So we have a very intellectually rigorous, intellectually diverse, respectful environment for people who are different from one another in their worldviews and in their, their basic intellectual orientations to be able to come together and discuss, debate, sometimes uh, say some tough things to one another and sometimes uh, in a very lighthearted spirit, make real progress toward finding common ground. You won't find common ground if you run to your DNC talking points or your RNC talking points. But if you dig deeper, if you look at our history, if you look at our deep politics, if you search for what Russell Kirk called the permanent things from the historical experience or from philosophical reflection, it's amazing what people will discover about the common ground that they share if they're willing to enter that conversation even though our culture, our intellectual culture right now does not encourage such dialogue. Well, here at the Hallenstein Center, we believe that that dialogue is essential. We support it, and we appreciate all the speakers who are part of it, who can disagree with rigor and with vim and vigor, but be respectful and search. Just a couple of highlights about uh, common ground from years past. I remember, for example, one year, we had uh, Victor Davis Hansen, the classicist, and Ariana Huffington, who's from Greece. So they were talking, talking a lot about things Greek. And they were kind of going at it. There was some tension in their, their debates. Suddenly, a thunderstorm came over, and all of the lights went out. <laughs> to which Victor Davis Hansen, it was like this light moment, all of a sudden, he said, well, Ariana, I think we need to ask Zeus to stop the lightning and turn the lights back on. Cracked everybody up. But there was an example, I think, of comedy and comedy that was very welcome in that situation. On a more substantive level, though, when we had Peter Hitchens and his more famous brother, Christopher Hitchens, we were the first place in the world to bring those two brothers together, the Allenstein Center. And uh, 60 Minutes, in fact, took a clip of our, of our uh, program and aired it later. Well, this was poignant because they had been intellectually, morally, familially estranged from one another for a long time. But we were able to bring them together and to see the two brothers, even though they had their intellectual disagreements, come together at that time. Really was a moving experience. Really proud of the fact that we were able to bring those two brothers back. And they spoke of him before Christopher's passing. Um, I always appreciated his, um, his reminiscence of that program. And then when we had Cornell West and Robbie George. Cornell West, you know, quite the radical. Robbie George, quite the conservative. Uh, team taught courses together. They had a lot of sharp intellectual disagreements. The program was covered on C-SPAN. And I will never forget, if you know Cornell West, he's quite the character. But I'll never forget, at a certain point, he leaned in to the microphone and toward Robbie. He reached out his hand. And he said, you know, 
really what all this is about is that Brother Robbie and I are here to search for the truth. Amen. That's exactly right. That's the spirit of the Common Ground Initiative. So that's the spirit we're going to carry on tonight. And we have a wonderful speaker who will get us started. And I'd like to invite Scott St. Louis forward to introduce our very distinguished speaker and our distinguished panel. Scott, thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening as we kick off the Howen Stein Center's Progressive Conservative Summit 2018. As Gleave said, my name is Scott St. Louis, and I have the privilege of serving as the program manager for the Common Ground Initiative here in the Howen Stein Center. And it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's keynote speaker, as well as a distinguished panel of respondents. We will begin things this evening with a presentation by Mark Lilla, professor of humanities at Columbia University. He previously held professorships at New York University and the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. A regular contributor to the New York Review of Books, he recently wrote The Once and Future Liberal, After Identity Politics, published by HarperCollins. The book expands on a brief essay that became the most widely read opinion piece of 2016 in the New York Times, having been published in November of that year. A scholar of Western political and religious thought, Professor Lilla is the author or co-editor of six other books. Following Professor Lilla's presentation, we will hear from four respondents. Patrick J. Deneen is the David A. Potenziani Memorial Associate Professor of Constitutional Studies at the University of Notre Dame. His latest book, Why Liberalism Failed, published by Yale University Press, has sparked conversation across the political spectrum, earning recommendations from previous Howenstein Center guests, Wilfred McClay and Cornell West, among many others. Professor Deneen is the author or editor of six additional books, including Democratic Faith and The Odyssey of Political Theory. Angela Dillard is Associate Dean of Undergraduate Education in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts at the University of Michigan, where she is also the Earl Lewis Collegiate Professor of Afro-American and African Studies and in the Residential College. Her first book, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner Now? Multicultural Conservatism in America, published by New York University Press, was among the first critical studies of conservative political thought among African Americans, Latinos, women, and homosexuals. Her second book, Faith in the City, Preaching Radical Social Change in Detroit, focuses on the interconnections of religion and political radicalism in Detroit from the 1930s to the 1960s. Both books reflect Professor Dillard's interests in the study of political ideologies, how they emerge, how they get deployed in the context of political movements, and how they change over the course of time. She is currently at work on a book, Civil Rights Conservatism, about unexpected alliances and intersections between the post-World War II civil rights movement and the rise of a new right. Daniel McCarthy is director of the Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship Program at the Fund for American Studies. He also serves as editor of Modern Age, a conservative review, which was founded by Russell Kirk. Previously, he served more than six years as editor of the American Conservative. Outside of journalism, he served as an internet communications coordinator for the Ron Paul 2008 presidential campaign and as a senior editor for ISI Books. He is a graduate of Washington University in St. Louis, where he studied classics. Karen Zivi is Associate Professor of Political Science in the Frederick Meyer Honors College at Grand Valley State University, where she teaches courses on human rights and feminist politics. She is the author of Making Rights Claims, a Practice of Democratic Citizenship, published by Oxford University Press. Her recent research on human rights and performative politics can be found in the Journal of Human Rights and Philosophy and Rhetoric. She is an editor at Contemporary Political Theory and serves on the editorial board of Citizenship Studies. She also serves as board chair for the Progressive Women's Alliance of West Michigan, an all-volunteer, women-led, nonpartisan political action committee, and one of the Howenstein Center's partners for this annual gathering. And after our respondents uh, have a chance to speak tonight, we'll give Professor Lilla an opportunity to respond and then move on to questions. You can move up to the microphones at the front of the aisles. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming these distinguished scholars to Grand Rapids. Can everyone here? I'm on a different mic. Okay, we're good. All right. Uh, thanks for everyone for being here. Uh, thanks for that introduction. It's always 
gratifying to hear a long list of one's accomplishments. Um, I'll add one more. I'd like to announce today that I've just been named the first president of Deep State University. And I'll be taking up my duties this fall. If uh, we're looking for ideas about mascots and a school song, so uh, let me know. All right, now into serious things. Uh, as Scott said, uh, my book grew out of an article uh, that I tossed off in two afternoons just to vent a little frustration after the 2016 election. It caused a bit of a firestorm. Um, and uh, to my surprise, um, I became a meme on the left uh, for making an argument that I'll make to you tonight about how important it is, if you want to help anyone in this country and any group, you must hold power. Now, I'm happy to talk about things relating to, the, um, uh, to that article and some of the polemics, but what I really want to do tonight is expand on something I just hint at at the end of the book and um, I've been giving more thought to, and that is the relation of identity to citizenship. And I'll talk about the concept of citizenship tonight, uh, which to my mind has no party. Uh, the book itself is based on a kind of historical conceit. I say that uh, American politics uh, from the 1930s until now can be divided fairly neatly into two dispensations, I call them, and I'll explain why I use that word in a minute. From the 1930s until 1980, there was what I call the Roosevelt Dispensation. Uh, begins with the New Deal, passes through civil rights, and then into the Great Society, and some of the uh, progress that was made in the early 70s. The second, the Reagan Dispensation, began in 1980 and was brought to a close by Donald Trump's populism. Now, each of these dispensations presented an image, a positive image of American destiny and a distinctive cap catechism of doctrines that set the terms of political debate. And whether you were a Democrat or a Republican, you had to recognize that there was one picture, a hopeful picture of the country, and it was replaced by another hopeful picture of the country, but they were very different. The Roosevelt Dispensation pictured an America where citizens pulled together to guard each other against risk, hardship, and the denial of fundamental rights. The watchwords were solidarity, opportunity, and public duty. The Reagan Dispensation pictured a more individualistic America, one where families and small communities and businesses would flourish once freed from the shackles of the state. Its watchwords were self-reliance and minimal government. The first dispensation, I'll be arguing, was a political dispensation. The second was anti-political. Now, why this term dispensation? Well, the idea of a dispensation is as old as the Bible, uh, well, it's in, as old as Christianity, I would say. Uh, but the basic notion in Protestant theology is at one point in history, certain rules applied uh, because God wanted them to apply then, and then there was a change, and then a new set of rules applied that did not cancel the first one or show that the first one was incorrect, but rather one was correct for one time, one was correct for another. Now, you can talk about a, a theological dispensation. Uh, it, it's a little harder to talk or to define just what a political dispensation is, but I think they exist. That's because a dispensation is not only animated by ideals and principles, it's also grounded in feelings and perceptions that give those principles and arguments psychological force. When a new di political dispensation arrives in any country, material reality may be unchanged, but somehow everything looks and feels different. The Roosevelt Dispensation began in the 1930s. And it began when liberals responded to conservatives' failure to confront the two great issues of the day, 
economic collapse, and the rise of fascism. Once in power, New Deal liberals uh, developed a catechism that was summed up in uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's famous Four Freedom speech of 1941. There he declared that the four pillars on which uh, the United States stood were freedom of speech, freedom of worship, conservatives agreed about that, but also freedom from want and freedom from fear. This expanded notion of freedom, along with the experiences of the Depression and World War II, established a new aspirational principle. According to this principle, all citizens deserve respect as citizens. We have equal what rights, but we also have duties towards each other. And we can legitimately use government to fulfill those duties. Now, of course, political principles are not political reality. I'm not saying that those principles were actualized. But they do announce an ambition to reshape political reality. And attached to this notion was a range of feelings and expectations in the public. The experiences of uh, the Depression, the war, and then the New Deal established an unprecedented sense of solidarity in this country. Uh, we need reminding that the kind of solidarity that came out of this generation lasted into the 80s or up until now was unusual in American history. It did not exist before. We were a much more individualistic nation before them. Um, but when a dispensation uh, takes hold, it shapes people's expectations no matter what party they, they vote for. In 1946, for example, no one would have responded to Ronald Reagan's message of 1980. And in the decades that followed, even Republicans during the Roosevelt dispensation had to take into account the expectations that arose from post-war solidarity. Young people in the audience may not know that the first president to propose a minimum income for all Americans and universal health insurance was Richard Nixon. Now, the Roosevelt dispensation ended in the 1970s for reasons familiar to you. Of course, we all have our private lists, lists of uh, what those things were. Um, but it happened. Enter Ronald Reagan, stage right, very right. Now, Reaganism ju didn't just come out of nowhere. Uh, for liberal opinion makers, it seemed to because they hadn't been paying attention. It was neither inevitable nor, as some of those liberals preferred to think, was it a kind of coup d'etat. Instead, Reaganism reflected a new social reality. 30 years of uninterrupted economic growth and technological advance reshaped how Americans lived and our sense of ourselves. White families left central cities and moved to a kind of suburban toy frontier with other settlers, all living in split-level air-conditioned wagons. Virtually every aspect of middle class life was transformed out there, making ours a more atomized society. Women were freed up from some drudgery by home appliances and the automobile, which you never underestimate the liberating power of the refrigerator for women around the world. But they were also more isolated and far from job opportunities in the suburbs. Later, the birth control pill, no fault divorce, legalized abortion, gave husbands and wives erotic independence from each other. And unsurprisingly, divorce rates went up, and men and women got married later, or not at all. Today, a large number of mothers find themselves struggling to raise children by themselves. And over these years, things began changing for children as well. Today, they all have fewer siblings, which means they have very, very few cousins, especially if their parents were single children. They spend a lot of time in their room talking to Siri. And uh, the, the more well-off ones live in actual or de, de facto gated communities, where no one takes a walk or strikes up a con uh, conversation with neighbors. Starting in the 70s, what Tom Wolfe called the, uh, the me decade, a new set of principles became prominent in the culture. Personal choice, individual rights, and self-definition. 
we now speak those words as if a wedding vow. We hear them in school, we hear them on television, we hear them in stuffy Wall Street boardrooms, we hear them in sun-filled uh, play pens in Silicon Valley, and we hear them in church. We hear them so often, personal choice, individual rights, self-definition, that it's hard for us to think or talk about any subject now except in these restricted, self-regarding terms. And so I think it was to be expected that eventually our politics would catch up with our reality and with our new self-regard. And that um, our politics and the dynamics of our politics <clears throat> would be influenced by this self-regard. <clears throat> So with the Reagan dispensation came a new catechism. It was very simple and clear and inspiring. It had four articles of faith. First, that the good life is that of self-reliant individuals. Individuals, of course, in their families and churches and small communities. But the good life did not depend on being citizens of a republic with reciprocal duties. Second, the building wealth had to take priority over sharing it. Third, that the freer markets are, the more they will grow and enrich everyone. And finally, that government, to quote Reagan, is the problem. Not tyrannical government, not in inefficient government, or unjust government, but government itself. It wasn't quite what Reagan meant, but that's what his believers came to, uh, his followers came to believe. Now, note, it's kind of obvious that this Reagan catechism was not conservative at all in any traditional sense. It treated self-determination as sacrosanct and more important than traditional ties of defense and obligation and tradition. It had next to nothing to say about the natural needs of groups from families and even to nations or of our obligation to meet them. It had a vocabulary for discussing mine and yours, but not a vocabulary for invoking the common good or addressing class and race and other social realities. Those of us uh, on the older side of the spectrum will, re will remember that even military service was marketed differently during the Reagan dispensation. I guess it sort of still is. The Army rec recruiting slogan that was introduced in 1980 was, be all you can be. Now think about that as a allure to lead, to, uh, for you to join the military and defend your country. Be all you can be. I find it hard to imagine Tom Hanks telling his troops that as they hit the beaches of Normandy. Tele uh, televised recruiting commercials still center on skills training and job opportunities that might open after active surface. They do not foc uh, focus on the experiences that soldiers themselves talk about afterwards, and that is camaraderie and sacrifice. During the George W. Bush administration, the slogan was changed yet ag again to an army of one perfect for our individualistic age, and a little more bellicose. Even the word government took on a weird echo during the Reagan dispensation that it hasn't lost. Republicans started speaking of it in ways that Richard Nixon never would have, as a kind of alien spaceship that descends on the happy families of middle suburb USA and sucks up all the resources and corrupts all the children and enslaves the population. Grover Norquist, who heads a, uh, a tax-cutting organization, I think of him as Ronald Reagan's fanatical St. Paul, expressed the new outlook with admirable and radical clarity. My ideal citizen, he once remarked, is a self-employed, homeschooling, IRA-owning guy with a concealed carry permit because that person doesn't need the goddamn government for anything. He went to Harvard, but he talks like that. <laughs> now, a, a traditional conservative uh, might not recognize himself in all of that, 
but even social conservatives today might object to what I've said about uh, Reagan. After all, he or she might insist that there was, of course, a moral dimension to Reaganism, but it left moral education to families and to ch especially to churches. Yet what was striking about American religion during these years was how easily it was adapted to the ambient individualism and libertarianism of the time. Before suburbanization, mainline Christian churches had thrived in ethnic urban neighborhoods, rural small towns where people knew each other. In the suburbs, though, people began drifting away or they joined new evangelical groups whose doctrines are remarkably free of dogma and guilt and certainly free of social obligation outside the small community. Over time, committing to even one of these churches has proved too constraining for Americans. We've gotten into the habit of what sociologists of religion call grazing, attending different churches on different Sundays, depending how the mood strikes us. Even the Bible began to sing a different tune in the Reagan years, one tied to success. Certain evangelical denominations have been so infected with this individualism, selfishness, and superficiality that what you hear there is no different from what one hears outside the church in American society. Members may still tithe to their churches, but they reject outright the notion that taxes, too, are a kind of democratic tithe that goes to helping fellow citizens like themselves. So that today Christian charity, like tipping, is being left to the uh, customer's discretion. The Reagan dispensation lasted 36 years by my count. So what were liberals, my team, what were liberals up to during this time? You might have thought that faced with the radically anti-political vision of the nation, liberals would have countered with an imaginative and hopeful political one, one that would have evoked what we share as citizens, what we might accomplish together, and especially what we owe each other. You might have thought that faced with Republican steady acquisition of institutional power from the bottom up, the slow march through the institutions that the Republicans have accomplished, the Democrats would pour their energies into winning elections at every level of government, beginning at the bottom, in every region of the country, reaching out especially to its traditional working class base. And you might have thought that faced with dogmatic libertarianism, <clears throat> liberal educators would have taught their students that they share a destiny with their fellow citizens and have duties towards them. That's the first thing to learn about living in a democracy. That whatever the differences are among us, we are one nation, or at least we seek to become one. You might have thought a lot of reasonable things, and you would have been wrong. Instead, we liberals got out of the vision business altogether. We directed our energy from party politics to movement politics, and became from elections to uh, court cases, and became especially enchanted with identity movements in particular. Little by little, liberals found themselves unable to articulate what we share as citizens and what binds us as a nation. And the further left you went, the more liberals spoke of the country in terms of groups and their differences. This mindset has proved electorally and therefore politically suicidal. And it has contributed to a massive transfer of political power in large sections of the country, from the Democratic Party to an increasingly radical Republican one. And the consequences have been perverse in the extreme. Unable to win elections in the vast middle of America, liberals have been unable to protect the very groups they care about in those states. This is the central point of my book that uh, my liberal critics fail to confront, even as a question. You cannot help anyone if you do not hold institutional power. The point of politics is not to fight authority. The point of politics is to become the authority. 
It was a suicide. And there's a mystery behind every suicide. But a backstory can also be told about the conditions and events and choices that set the stage for the ultimate climax. The story of how a once successful liberal politics of solidarity became a failed liberal politics of difference is not a simple one, and I don't want to pretend that it is. But I think one good place to begin to understand where it came from is to reflect a bit on a slogan that was very popular in the 1970s when I was in school and college. The personal is the political. To understand that slogan and why it proved so compelling all of a sudden to young people, we need to take a second look back at this suburban frontier and ask what was going on with the young people who grew up on it. One striking new development was that a significant fraction of the suburban white middle class became convinced that they were undergoing what was called an identity crisis. Now this term, which we use commonly, actually was coined only in the early 1950s by a German psychologist named Eric Erickson to describe the anxiety amid plenty that he found in his adoptive country. After the war, he's wondering why he's seeing so many patients so anxious and depressed in the midst of peace and prosperity. The more the frontier settlers freed themselves from economic and social necessity, the more confused they were becoming about what to do with this liberty that they had. What would a meaningful, authentic life look like now that it was possible? The question was most pressing for, young, for these young people who had only known peace and prosperity. Not all the college students in bobby socks and brush cuts were surfing during, during spring break. They were reading the recently translated French existentialists. Franz Kafka's stories, the meditations of Thomas Merton, the plays of Samuel Beckett. They were also joining unconventional, uh, unconventional religious groups like Campus Crusades for Christ or the Catholic uh, Charismatic Renewal, one center of which was down in Ann Arbor, not far from here. While their parents were building personal wealth, they were asking themselves what it means to be a person at all. And it was this generation searching for personal meaning through political engagement that made the 1960s, or much of the 1960s, happen. And this phrase, the personal is the political, became their slogan. Now, originally, it was interpreted to mean that everything that's, that had been deemed simply private, sexuality, the family, the workplace, is in fact also deeply political, that there are no spheres of life that we can claim are exempt somehow for a struggle for power. That's true. And it's also what made the doctrine so radical and exciting, I think. But the phrase could also be understood in a more romantic sense, that what we think of as political action is nothing but personal activity, an expression of me and how I define myself. As we would say today, it is a reflection of my identity. And over time, I think, since the 70s, the, this romantic view of identity went out over the radical one. And on the left, the idea got rooted to reverse the formula that the political is the personal. Liberals and progressives continue to fight for social justice in all sorts of spheres, but they also wanted there to be no space between what they felt inside and what they did in the world, how they engaged. They wanted their political engagements to mirror how they understood and defined themselves as individuals. And they wanted that self-definition recognized. In the early 60s, the big issue on campus, apart from, well, there's a civil rights movement, obviously, but it was also uh, nuclear weapons. Now, for white students on college campuses, neither of those issues were about their self-definition. They were interested in engaging in the world out there, in justice out there, and developing a picture of how all these issues hold together, how they're related out there. That's what's been lost on the left. And it was an innovation. 
Socialism had no time for individual recognition. Everyone's rushing to the revolution. And socialism divided the world into exploited, exploiting capitalists on the one hand, exploiting workers of every background on the other. New Deal liberals were just as indifferent to individual identity. They thought and spoke in terms of equal rights and equal social protections for all. Uh, somewhat hypocritically, they didn't always succeed, but that was the aspiration. Even the early identity movements, if you want to call them that, of the 50s and 60s, to secure the rights of African Americans, Latinos, women, and gays, appeal to our shared humanity and citizenship to bring about change. They drew people together rather than setting them apart. I just taught uh, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail to my students last week, and the word identity, I pointed out to them, doesn't appear once. Now all that began to change when the new left shattered in the 70s, in no small part due to these identity issues. So blacks complained that white movement leaders were racist, feminists complained that they were sexist, lesbians complained that they were homophobic, uh, and suddenly the main enemies were no longer capitalism and the military industrial complex. The enemy became fellow, fellow movement members who were not radical enough who were not, as we would say today, sufficiently woke. And as the 70s wore on, even less radical liberals and progressive activists began redirecting their, their energies away from party politics and actually seizing institutional power. First, they, were, they got interested in all sorts of issue-based movements, which is understandable, the environment and all the rest. Then identity ones, also understandable um, in terms of just uh, fighting for group rights, not, not in terms of one's individual identity. And these social movements have made this country a more tolerant, more just, and more inclusive place than it was 50 years ago. But engagement with movements transformed the way liberals thought about their country and engaged with their fellow citizens. You see, movement politics tends over time to be disuniting. And that's why there's all this talk about intersectionality, which seems to mean two different things, but one, one meaning seems to be that all these identity movements suddenly need to see that they are all facing similar problems, trying to reinvent a wheel that everyone used to put their shoulder into together. Movement politics are centrifugal. They encourage splits into smaller and smaller factions, obsessed with single issues and practicing rituals of ideological one-upmanship. Symbols, rather than elections and institutions, take on an outsized significance, especially in identity-based movements. The forces at work in party politics are, are centripetal. They encourage factions and interests to come together to work out common goals and strategies. They oblige everyone to think, or at least to speak, about the common good. The Democratic Party's current inability to articulate a coherent vision of that good and how to achieve it through active government is basically owing to the fact that the mindset of movement politics and identity movement politics captured the party itself. When the party looks out its window, it sees tribes. And when the tribe members themselves look at themselves. They not only see group members, they now see themselves as possessors of an identity that sets them off from the rest of the world, that makes them the individuals they are. You know, there are two ways of thinking about identity. One is in terms of identification. That is, I identify with a cause, or I identify with a group that's fighting for something, or I as a New Yorker, I identify with the New York Mets. Now, that's different from having an identity as a possession. If rooting for the Nets, uh, sorry, the Mets, uh, was central to my identity as a person, that would make me a very sad individual, I have to say. Um, so it, it's one thing to identify with something, but once you get the idea, you have a little identity, this little thing within, this homunculus, a kind of replacement for the soul, 
an individual psychological replacement for the soul, a ghost in the machine, this unique little thing that you put together with little parts and colors, tinted by race and sex and gender, but something very much your own, something that can get hurt, that has bad feelings. How are you today? Not so well, my identity isn't feeling so good. Sorry to hear that. Now, interestingly, some Marxists have complained about exactly this new focus on the self, the inner secret self, and rightly so. It's no accident, they suggest, that an ideology of personal identity developed in our universities in the age of Reagan remains strong. The individual material forces of the age are working together to keep young Americans self-involved. Identity politics is just a kind of expression of that. Everything in our society is pushing in this direction. And it pushes our young people to think that narcissism with attitude is both good business and good politics. Identity politics, though, is not the future of the left. It is not a force hostile to Reaganite libertarianism and neoliberalism. Identity is Reaganism for lefties. For four decades now, American politics has been dominated by two ideologies that have encouraged and even celebrated the unmaking of citizens. On the right, an ideology that questions the existence of a common good, denies our obligation to help our fellow citizens through government action. On the left, an ideology institutionalized in colleges and universities that fetishizes our individual and group attachments and casts a shadow of suspicion over the word we. At Columbia University, where I teach, this is how we pronounce the word we. We. This at a time when precisely because America has become more diverse, has become more individualistic in reality, there is greater, not less, need to cultivate political fellow feeling. But what's missing is a vocabulary for articulating what makes this a republic, not a campsite, not a parking lot, not a battleground of warring tribes. A vocabulary that articulates what makes us citizens and not just members of groups or consumers or autonomous elementary particles or that awful word I hate, taxpayer. The word taxpayer is replaced citizen as if it's a transaction. I pay my taxes, where's my stuff? Yeah, citizenship means something else. What's missing is a vocabulary that might appeal to our collective democratic imagination. So, what can be done about this? Frankly, I'm not sure anything can be, at least in the short term. I know as good Americans, you've come here expecting a happy ending and a three-point plan for solving everything. I don't have one. We have become a kind of sociological oxymoron, a libertarian society. Half the country seems to believe they don't need the goddamn government for anything, and they certainly have no overriding civic duty towards others. The other half demands government actions for the interests and groups that matter to them, but have disdain for fellow citizens who don't see the world the way they do. Anti-government sentiment and identity consciousness are here for now, and they're related to, to the way we live in our society, material relations, and they can't just be wished away. All one can do, I think, is to try to begin to persuade our country's tribes that appealing to our shared citizenship and trying to shore it up is in everyone's short-term and long-term political interest for every group. I have no idea how one would do that on the right, though I have a sense that this vogue for economic nationalism is, is a way in which the right is, is starting to stumble on the question of citizenship and what we share uh, and what we owe each other uh, in this country. But I do have some thoughts about what it might mean for my political tribe. And the argument I would make to my fellow liberals would be this. Citizenship is a political status. It's nothing less and nothing more. 
To say that we are all citizens is not to say that we are all alike in every respect. It is a social fact and a wonderful fact that we are a diverse country, that many Americans today are highly aware of the groups they belong to, that enriches us. But there is no reason why they cannot simultaneously think of themselves as political citizens like everyone else. Both ideas can be, and in fact, are true. The only thing you share with anyone in this country that you know you share with them is citizenship. That and going to the DMV. Now, one advantage of framing liberal politics in terms of citizenship is that the status and meaning of it can be expanded. It's not something fixed. The American right uses the term citizenship today as a tool of exclusion, especially directed at immigrants. But liberals have traditionally seen the term citizen as a generous tool for inclusion and enfranchisement. The original idea of being a citizen in Europe meant that you weren't owned by anybody. But there was a monarch and you weren't necessarily participating in uh, the exercise of authority. It was a formal designation and was restricted to a small class of people, white men with property. But in the 19th century, in Europe and the United States, there were social struggles over expanding, and into the well into the 20th century, over expanding the formal franchise to include women, African Americans, and the rest. In the, and then in the early 20th century, the concept for some liberals of citizenship was expanded to include the kind of benefits you need, the minimum you need in order to live a life, a dignified life as an American citizen, not just the right to vote, but the ability to walk down the street with your head held high, not fearing poverty or discrimination. All liberal arguments to improve the welfare state can be formulated in terms of citizenships. It provides a political language for speaking of solidarity that uh, transcends our other attachments. And it reminds us that the way, the, the only reason we have rights is that we also have duties as citizens. They're reciprocal. Not too long ago, that was obvious. During the Second World War, the Depression afterwards, one didn't have to demonstrate to people that rights and duties were connected. The fight against fascism and uh, the New Deal made that perfectly obvious. But the debacle of Vietnam made the notion of duty laughable to those who opposed it and then when it failed to much of the country. The political creeds of our time make it virtually impossible to talk about duty. It was striking during the Reagan years for, that for all his talk of America as the last line of defense against tyranny, not once in his presidency did he ask the public to make any sacrifices to defend freedom at home or abroad. He and his successors found it much easier to expand the deficit so they could rely on an all-volunteer force. Then all they would have to do is give soldiers prior priority boarding on planes and thank them for their service. Though I can imagine Grover Norquist asking, why even do that? They got paid. The left, which wants an act of government to address common problems, especially has a stake in helping to build a sense of civic duty. But identity liberalism has now banished the word we to the outer reaches of respectable discourse but there is no future for liberalism without that word. Historically, liberals have called on us to ensure equal rights. They want us to feel a sense of solidarity with those less fortunate and, we, and want us to help them. We is where everything begins. But by abandoning this term or just casting a cloud of suspicion over it, identity liberals have landed themselves in a strategic contradiction. When identity activists speak about themselves today, they are especially determined to assert their difference. And many react testily to any hint that their particular experience or needs are being erased or that someone can tell them what they're experiencing. But when they call for political action, 
to address, uh, to assist their group X, they demand it from people that they have already defined as not X and who have been told that their experiences cannot be compared to their own. But if that's the case, why should the people in group non-X care about the people in group, group X if there's nothing to share? Why would you expect them to feel anything at all? I can tell you when I pose this question to young people wrapped up in this kind of politics, they don't have an answer to this question. The problem just has never occurred to them. Now, of course, it's obvious that people in different identity groups do have vastly different experiences and problems. Take, you know, one of the curses in, in our country, you know, take the example of a black male motorist who was pulled over repeatedly by the police for the crime of driving while black. I recognize that I'm not a black male motorist. I will never be. And I can't fully share his experience of humiliation and rage when he looks in the rearview mirror and sees the lights on the, uh, on the patrol car. Now, if I've been brought up with a strong sense of religious duty and have been told to love my neighbors myself, chances are I'll naturally feel some sympathy for this person. But as I've said, that religious sense of Christian charity has declined in America. You can't count on it politically. So what might replace it or supplement it? Take an example of an unemployed minor in the, up, uh, in the Upper Peninsula. White guy who's angry that he can't support his family alone anymore. How are you going to persuade him to care about the black motorist? And how are you going to get the black motorist to think about this other guy? You have to begin with the fact with the one fact they share, the only thing they share, they're citizens. And persuade them the citizens need to stick together because they're citizens. They don't need to understand each other's stories. They don't have to accept their self-definitions. I mean, it helps socially, but it's not necessary. If they both recognize the principle of solidarity among citizens, that is a start. Liberals have to... Um, teach young people that citizens are not, are not roadkill. They are not collateral damage. They are not the tail of the distribution. A citizen simply by virtue of being a citizen is one of us. That's what liberalism means, at least to me. Maybe it's blindness on my part or uh, authorial uh, vanity, but I fail to see how my fellow liberals could object to this formulation. But as I'm learning, they do. The resistance on the left to the message of my book, and it's not just my message, is being echoed by not a small number of Democratic elected officials today, and we'll see how that shakes out in the next election, shows just how I intense the identity fever is. And one has to be blind, willfully blind, not to see how it is also provoked and to some extent legitimized um, an explicit, rather than just implicit, white identity politics we see on the right today. Liberals are making breakfast for Steve Bannon every morning. And that's why there's no happy ending to this talk. All one can do is make the case and hope that eventually, and after not too many defeats, the fever passes. If it doesn't, then I fear that the populist wave that brought our current president to power will only identify intensify. And that would open an even darker chapter of our history. Thank you. Is this on? Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you, first of all, to the Howenstein Center for this invitation. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to talk about a book that's not my own. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate uh, being able to reread Mark's book. He visited us last uh, semester at uh, Notre Dame, and uh, we had a very stimulating and uh, I think a very rich uh, conversation and discussion with, with Mark at that time. Uh, I, as I thought when I read the book the first time and reread it uh, for, in preparation for this event, I think there's much to be praised in Mark's book. Uh, I think above all his, what I, uh, 
I think a sentiment we deeply share, a concern uh, for the deepening fragmentation and atomization of contemporary American society, the deep and pervasive what Alexis de Tocqueville uh, described as his concern about individualism as a defining hallmark of modern liberal democracy, a kind of the inability of people to um, form and shape their lives uh, uh, in, in combination with others to see a shared fate uh, together. Uh, and in, I think in terms that I, I think are uh, in some ways more articulated uh, in his talk tonight than appeared originally in the book, the, the further thought of, of uh, renewal of citizenship uh, that I very much um, uh, deeply appreciate and agree with. Uh, but let me, let me offer uh, some, some reflections on, on Mark's book. And uh, Mark tells a story which he told tonight about um, really two dispensations, the, the, the Roosevelt dispensation, which is really one in his telling of a kind of understanding of the common good uh, that was shared widely and dispersed widely through the country. Uh, and then the rise of the Reagan dispensation, a kind of time of a more ruthless individualism, a particularly economic libertarianism. Uh, that uh, replaced that Roosevelt dispensation. And then, in some ways, partaking, as I think Mark is suggesting, partaking of that latter dispensation, the left's self-inflicted political suicide, uh, particularly the identity politics that, that he describes itself as a kind of what he calls a kind of Reaganism for lefties, uh, the individualism that it, it uh, implies and embraces. Uh, and yet, I think the story that he tells, while it is um, it's in many ways uh, quite appealing, for, in part because of its simplicity, to it obscure some important complexities. And I think in particular um, tells a story that's uh, especially self-congratulatory to political liberalism or the left side of the, of the, uh, of the side, even, even with his critiques of contemporary identity politics. Um, and in, in a sense, um, I think for, uh, uh, obscures uh, just how difficult uh, in many ways uh, uh, overcoming this individualism is not only because of Reaganism or identity politics, but because of the entire, in a sense, American political system writ large, uh, the liberal system itself. Uh, and in a way, uh, it's the problem lies not in one political party or one aberration of the left political party today, but more deeply within liberalism itself, which is, as Tocqueville recognized, a political system that fosters individualism that actually atomizes us, and that neither party is really offering us any particularly fetching uh, alternative. Uh, when, when Mark describes the rise of Reaganism, he, uh, he, he makes a, a peculiar claim, uh, and it's one that uh, he made here again tonight, and I'll, I'll actually read this passage. He talks about the four articles of faith of Reaganism, and this is the first of them, that the good life is that of self-reliant individuals, individuals embedded perhaps in families, churches, and small communities, but not citizens of a republic with common goals and duties to each other. That's a very strange sentence, I have to say. I mean, who is a member of a family or a church or a small community and in some ways thinks of themselves first and foremost as, as a radical individual or a radical autonomous self? Uh, it seems to me that it's a peculiar formulation, and what it suggests to me is that in Marx's um, way of thinking, that the only form in which you can articulate and support the common good is really through a kind of devotion and, and support of the federal government. But I think this, is a, this draws a contrast or draws a, uh, a distinction that I think is, is, is uh, uh, not borne out in reality. In part, if we think about that that part of the dispensation that Mark White supports, uh, the, the year the Roosevelt years, that was a time in American history of some of the strongest families, and the strongest membership and relationships formed in churches, and the strongest small communities that our country uh, enjoyed, the time before the rise of the suburbs. It was not in spite of those commitments and the kind of commitments that one learns in those kinds of places, the very language that Mark invokes of duty and self-sacrifice and commitment and a concern for people outside of yourself, that in some ways the time of the greatest national spirit that we may have known leading up to World War II and that greatest generation, a time of great self-sacrifice, was also a time of deep and thick relationships in these more local forms of life. It seems to me that Reaganism the rise of Ronald Reagan was at least in part an acknowledgement that America was in the midst of a kind of crisis of individualism. This is when I came of intellectual age, the rise of communitarianism, 
This was a concern of both the left and the right. It wasn't just one party or the other. Uh, the concern of the fragmentation and atomization of society. And Reagan, it just seems to me, was not appealing merely to individualism when he made those kinds of appeals to the small town America that was increasingly being lost or to family values that were increasingly being ripped apart uh, by, by a whole set of social forces. In this sense, then, what we could say is that Reaganism wasn't just about individualism. It was appealing to something, something about relationships and commitments. And it wasn't in, in contradiction, necessarily, to what we could think about as forms of devotion to something larger than oneself. If anything, it was a time of great and over, almost overweening patriotism. Right. Ronald Reagan was, if nothing else, a, a very good stage manager of patriotism. It was a patriotism that didn't necessarily call on a lot of self-sacrifice. That, that has to be given, and I, agreed with, I agree with Mark's assessment. But let's notice that in some ways what Reagan was doing was appealing in one sense to the deep sense of desire for people to belong to something, to be a part of something, and to recall that, that time of life when it seemed that there was a thicker set of relationships in American society, while wedding that also to his deeply individualistic and libertarian economic preferences and policies. And I think what we have to notice is that these two parts of Reaganism brought together a kind of coalition of people, social conservatives, religious people, as well as economic libertarians. And what won? What improved under Ronald Reagan? What part of this agenda succeeded or succeeded more? Did America become stronger in its family life, in its community life, in its small town life? Or did America have uh, more of a libertarian economic system as a result? And it seems to me that uh, in many ways, the very success of the one part of Reagan's agenda actually continued to undermine the other part that at least he claimed to want to support. But it's not just Reagan. It's not just Reagan, and it's not just the right where you see this kind of contradiction. Because all of those aspects and elements that Mark just related to us about what preceded the rise of Reaganism, the falling apart of family life, the rise of the divorce rate, declining marriages, declining birth rates, the increasing kind of culture of random hookups, the, the fruits of the sexual revolution, legalized abortion, which Mark declares himself to be an absolutist on abortion. What are these but, in another way, forms of individualism, commitments to individualism that also exacerbate the atomization? And these were not the fruits of identity politics. These were the fruits, in many ways, of the left's political agenda often exercised through the courts, but not only the courts. The left, then, is not only the, the party that calls for our commitment to the common good, especially through taxation and welfare and redistribution, but also has been deeply embedded, and it seems to me, in advancing an individualistic agenda. And which part of the left's agenda has won over this period of time? Is it greater economic equality, greater economic justice, greater care and concern for those who are falling behind in our economic system? Or is it the fruits of the sexual revolution? Which of these has won? I would submit to you that it's the part of the agenda of both the left and the right, of both the liberals and the conservatives, or what I would simply call conservative liberals and liberal liberals, right liberals and left liberals. That's the part of the agenda that's won, in a sense, in every turn. And why is that is because it conforms fundamentally to liberal philosophy that eventually, in some ways, we could say, becomes instantiated in our politics, in our world. It seems to me that Mark, um, I know Mark knows Tocqueville as well as anyone who's alive, but he doesn't at least sufficiently recognize or acknowledge Tocqueville's, uh, Tocqueville's analysis and where he ends democracy in America, that a strong centralized government and individualism are not opposites. They're not opposites. Indeed, as Tocqueville argues, they're mutually reinforcing. That without the thick relationships of civil society, of family, and community, and religion, the result would be the fragmentation and atomization of society. And in that condition, the only source or place that people could turn to for assistance, as Tocqueville describes it, would be the state. And so if one understands the common good as, in a sense, vested solely in the state and not recognize that the state, in a way, is a part, but only a part of 
formation of the common good and not give sufficient credit to families and communities and churches and small towns. And I think in that condition, in some ways, what you're implicitly acknowledging is that there can't be a common good if the state is the only vehicle in which you're going to vest in a sense of the common good. So in a way, it's what strikes me is that the call, and I think very much I admire the call in Mark's book for cultivation of duty, of being and seeing something greater than oneself, of giving of oneself and self-sacrifice, difficult lessons to learn, but those are lessons learned, oddly enough, often in non-liberal places in one's life. Learned first and hopefully in the family, not usually run on completely liberal uh, forms of rule, as my children will tell you. These are learned in churches. These are learned in communities and associations. All those aspects of life that have been hollowed out both by the left and the right in our country the parts of the agenda of the left and the right that have consistently won. So I, I worry, I worry about, um, in the first instance, what I heard tonight was interesting, Mark recognizing that it's in the churches, at the end of his talk tonight, it's in the churches or in the families that one would have learned this form of solidarity. And in their decline, he said, in the face of their decline, what will replace them? And here again, he said, perhaps turning to the state as a space where we can begin to see the common good. I would invite him to think more and perhaps join me in thinking about the ways we can strengthen family and church and small communities and places of discourse like the universities and the schools. And that this might be the place where we actually can reactivate a sense of the common good that might not be in the places that ideally the liberal world would want, in some ways, uh, to strengthen. It seems to me there's much in liberalism today that is quite content and happy to see the dissolution of what is often described as spaces of oppression. But if indeed it is the case that the common good demands a kind of training ground for these qualities that I think you admirably call for, then perhaps we can find common ground in supporting those areas of life that it seems to me that liberalism has been very successful at disassembling. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here um, this evening, and greetings from the great Republic of Ann Arbor. Uh, really nice to drive up and be here in Grand Rapids. Um, I'll actually describe my, my own politics as fairly communi communitarian, which, you know, it is true that there was kind of that moment, right, where, where that was, you know, a language that was very current. Um, I still cling to it for all kinds of reasons, and so it's a communitarian politics deeply informed by my own Catholicism, um, which tends to inflect towards the left side of the political spectrum. Um, I actually think that the, the, the United States is really faced with a massive ideological problem, um, and I think, you know, what one, the, one way of thinking about it um, is to try and kind of you know, drain it down to, to two major things. One is the belief that time is um, linear and progressive, right? So that the future is always better than the past. Time moves in a straight line. Things get better. Time progresses. Um, and then second, that race is marginal. The race is largely marginal to the American experience. And I think when you put these two ideological tendencies together, you really have a problem, right? But because you have a sense that racist is a marginal thing that's left in the past, right? And it keeps us um, from seeing um, time as largely um, cyclical, that the, that the past is now, right? That, that you can kind of think of time in really different ways, not as this linear progression. And then it keeps us from thinking about racist central. And I think when you put those two things together, it explains a lot about what's really tricky about American political culture and American politics in general, but because we, we can't have that conversation, right? That the kind of that race is now and that race is central, right? Means that, that I think we don't have a really clear understanding of these things, and that this ripples throughout the politics in all kinds of ways, not only in the present but historically. So for me, you can draw a fairly straight line between Andrew Johnson saying about Reconstruction. Right, this moment where the, the nation is recovering from slavery, the great sin of the nation, 
right, a democratic nation that, you know, is slaveholding, you know, at its core. Um, finally, right, a war to, 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 to erase the stain of this moment. Um, and soon as Reconstruction is really underway, right, a, it's about repairing um, the lives of former slaves, re, um, putting families back together, establishing communities, right, that he says, you know, the problem of Reconstruction is that it puts the, the, the white neck of the South under the, the, the black boot, right, so that the problem is the federal government has sided with blacks against the white population and that this is the problem. And I think you can draw a straight line from that moment um, to now the rejoinder to um, the, the slogan, Black Lives Matters, which I, I think has got to be one of the most depressing political slogans ever chanted on American soil, right? The need to even say that, right? I mean, just really takes my breath away. But that the rejoinder to that would be, oh, no, no, all lives matter, right? And the kind of inability, again, to think if you're trying to solve a problem of the black population created by ideas of race and racism, that it automatically means that you are disadvantaging, disadvantaging the white population, right? And that that's not, that's not something that's really allowable. In fact, I would argue that at no point in American politics have movements for black rights, for black inclusion, um, to be treated as full citizens ever been embraced, right? I mean, you really think about the vitriol against movement after movement, um, decade after decade, right, as um, people have fought to extend the rights of the black population. I was, you know, um, spending some time uh, yesterday in preparing for the talk, looking at the kinds of things said about Martin Luther King in the 1950s and 1960s in this country, right? So we embrace him now, certainly wasn't the case then. He was called divisive, dangerous, um, un-American, fundamentally un-American, so un-American that he had to be a communist, right? There's just no way that this could be possible um, to have someone like him speaking in this vein um, in the United States. And so I think it's really instructive to kind of keep that in mind when we're thinking about, um, you know, connections between identity and politics, right, um, right now in the United States. Um, so I think some of the real problems have always been about incorporation and inclusion, that th these aren't new problems, right? These are deeply American problems, that this is the, the American struggle, right, to figure out how to do this well. Um, and I'm not sure that the nation is often, has always believed that it's even possible to be fully incorporated, right, to be fully diverse, to be fully inclusive. Um, de Tocqueville himself raised all kinds of questions about this. There's a really nice part of Democracy in America um, where he's talking about um, Native Americans and African Americans. It's the, you know, the, the, the white, the red, the black. And he kind of can't really conceive of the nation ever solving this fundamental problem. Um, in fact, you know, he tells us an American story that's really about New England and not about the South because he thinks that the South is a kind of disaster. Right, because that's the place where you can't imagine um, something that might look like a multiracial democracy. Not his terms, but I think that's what he's kind of thinking about. And it's unimaginable to him, and so he kind of hopes that the South is just going to die off, right? And that the story is going to be this New England story. It's a really interesting tension that runs throughout that text uh, in all kinds of ways. Um, I fundamentally believe, though, that di diversity and community are not necessarily at odds. Um, and that there are moments where, um, you know, that as a nation we really grapple with these. Let me just talk really quickly about two, three, um, that I think are really interesting. The first actually comes from the uh, Republican Autopsy, um, which was published in 2013. It was about the, 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 the 2012 election, right? Things had not gone so well. Um, there's six major takeaways uh, from that document. One is pass immigration reform as quickly as possible. Two, listen to minorities. Three, um, don't, um, don't, don't fool yourself, gays aren't going anywhere. Four, um, uh, epistemic closure is a problem, right, that the party can't, can't just talk to itself, it has to be able to talk to a broader public. Five, look to the states, right? Don't look to the, the, the 
the federal Republicans are problematic. The ones of the states are where you go. And six was um, to stop being the party of rich people. It's a really interesting document. None of it, you know, um, at all foreshadowed the coming of Donald Trump. Uh, and where the party goes from that moment to where it is now, I think is a really interesting question. But I think it's really helpful to look back to that moment where the Republican Party was trying to figure out how to do things differently. And a lot of what they were talking about was this problem of being fully inclusive, fully democratic, right? Valuing um, all identities, all people as citizens. Um, the other thing that's really interesting to think about right now and uh, this was such a nice opportunity to um, read Mark's book, which I had read a lot of the reviews of it, but I hadn't really sat down and read the book. And part of the way through, it occurred to me um, that, that there is one place right now in American politics where something like what he maybe envisions is, in fact, unfolding. Um, and it's in North Carolina in a movement read, led by the Reverend William Barber. Um, who, for me, is, is such an inspiring figure. Um, so he's the person that launched Moral Mondays in North Carolina. It was started in 2007, but really came to national prominence um, in um, 2012 uh, as the Republicans took over the State House um, in North Carolina with a supermajority and start to pass a lot of legislation um, that, that Barber and a lot of people, uh, especially in the state's NAACP, were really deeply worried about. Rolling back voting rights, um, working around redistricting, um, putting in a lot of policies that uh, Barber and others have felt have been deeply harmful to the population of the state. Uh, and in fact, that the courts have ruled um, that some of the stuff, especially around voting and redistricting, is targeting African Americans in a way that is simply undeniable to keep them from voting. Um, so this was a movement to really kind of drill down on voting rights fundamentally, to work on redistricting. Um, and it does this in a way um, that draws on identity politics um, really forthrightly. Right? It, it, they work around immigrant rights, they work around um, LGBT rights, they work around women's rights. Um, but then, right, in a kind of um, coalition around solidarity, around a common enemy, right, for policies that they argue are, again, disastrous for the health and welfare of the community and of residents of North Carolina. Um, again, it's been an inspiring movement. Barber is now... Um, taking the movement national uh, in, in more ways. He's trying to start a moral movement. Um, part of it is called Re Repairers of the Breach, in which he's calling again on human solidarity, I think in really profound ways. And he sees this as potentially a third reconstruction. In fact, if you're interested in his political thinking, uh, I can recommend his book, The Third Reconstruction, how a moral movement is overcoming the politics of fear and division. So really, I think, um, however you come down and think about it, I think what he's up to is, again, a really stirring moral vision for America. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that, that, that Barber um, is most concerned about, again, is not so much identity liberalism. Um, I mean, I think he would probably say it's neoliberalism. Um, and I know that there are a lot of definitions of this term. It gets bandied about a lot. Uh, one definition, the one that, that, that I think with a lot, is the reduction of all rights to the rights of the market and the reduction of all values to the values of the market. Right? I mean, he says that this is really the fundamental problem, and that that's what's turning American politics into a cesspool. Right? That citizens have become consumers, that we've disinvested in the public in all kinds of ways, um, in the public sector and public education in particular, um, and that now we're kind of reaping the effects of that uh, on our politics, on our culture, and on ourselves. Um, reinvesting in institutions, I think, is an important part of that. Um, and let me just end with a plug for thinking about college campuses as one place in which that reinvestment can happen. Um, so certainly it's a problem that the, the, the defunding of public education means that 
the relationship of college students to their education is fundamentally changed by this. Right? If you have to pay so much money to be at a place like the University of Michigan that your parents have to, 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 to struggle to allow you to do that, that's going to mean that you're going to think of education in a much more transactional way. Right? And so that this is a problem. But even with that problem, when I look at the landscape of, of the United States and our political culture, I tend to see universities as, as a kind of bright spot. I mean, they, they don't come off always so well in Mark's book. Um, but I think that there are a lot of things going on on co college campuses among young people that really speak to what Danielle Allen, the political theorist, calls bridging, right? the, the ability to have conversations across differences. Right, polling data really shows that young people are enormously open and flexible to different points of view. Um, I, they often get kind of a bad name. And, um, and I think that, that, that there are a lot of projects going on right now on college campuses. I'll just talk about one, it's called We Listen, um, in which uh, they're, they're about, you all would really love this, they're about um, bringing together conservatives and Republicans, not to debate, Right, so not to kind of hash out the issues right, in this left-right way, but to work on empathy. Right, so these young people have really understood that part of the problem is that we're losing the capacity for empathy. Um, and unless we restore that, um, then we're really going to have a lot of problems. Right, and that they're not going to be able to try and create the kind of society that, that they would want to live with that they would want to live in in the future. Um, I actually think it's a tremendous project. Um, it's spreading across our campus very quickly. Um, and I think if there's a bright spot for me, it's watching how much traction this has gotten um, on our campus and then watching it spread to other campuses. So I, I think for me, again, I'll kind of end on, on a, a bit of a brighter note. Um, I'm going to put my faith in young people. Thank you. <clears throat> well, Patrick and Angela have covered so much so well that many of my remarks are simply going to be a gloss and perhaps a reinterpretation of some of the things they've already said. Uh, and then I may bring some notes of pessimism into the discussion as well, or at least some notes of conflict, which um, perhaps uh, Karen can then either amplify or resolve. And uh, when Mark Lilla gives his uh, uh, additional remarks, uh, perhaps he wants to address as well. Um, I agree with Patrick that citizenship in the abstract is not going to be nearly enough to keep the country together. Uh, you know, when you talk about the Roosevelt dispensation, what were the things that undergirded it or that um, helped to uh, make it politically possible? Um, it was the fact that I think you had a harmony between the way American family life, American uh, economic life, and American religious life tended to intersect with one another and the way in which they could all be co-opted into the Roosevelt dispensation's vision. If you start to do away with that, if you no longer have the degree of um, uh, large consensus, super majoritarianism about religion, about um, what the purpose of a nation and an economy are, and if you no longer have um, the basis that uh, provides the support for a vision like the Roosevelt Dispensation, you can't go back to it. And simply uh, referring to citizenship itself would never have been enough uh, in Roosevelt's time, and it's not going to be enough certainly in our time, which is much more fragmented. I think we need to keep in mind certain economic realities here. Uh, I think Andrew Hartman is in the audience, and he may recall I once gave a talk at uh, his organization, the uh, uh, U.S. Intellectual History Society, where um, I, as a conservative, actually brought up Karl Marx and said that perhaps uh, we should all read a little bit more of Karl Marx for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, thing to, one reason to have that in mind is because um, the kinds of economic systems you have and the kinds of companies you have, the modes of production you have, tend to influence the kinds of families that you have. Uh, now, I'm not a Marxist. I think the, uh, you know, it's not a matter of pure determinism, but there certainly is an interplay between these institutions. So it's one thing to say that um, you, know, you could go back to strong families and go back to a certain kind of uh, traditional morality, and then that would restore the country. Uh, I, I think that's the more sort of hopeful side that you sometimes find in Patrick Deneen. 
But that too is not going to be enough. You can't just reaffirm uh, citizenship in the abstract. You can't just reaffirm Tocqueville or Aristotle or um, you know, the, the value of uh, good intact families. You actually need to have the institutional apparatus to make it all possible. And it all needs to interact with one another and, and sort of strengthen the system uh, so that it stands as opposed to falling. And that's going to be very difficult to do, not only because it's very hard to turn back the clock or to adjust things uh, to uh, match a vision that has already passed, but also because um, the effects of so much atomization, uh, as Patrick and uh, Mark Lilla have both discussed, um, are going to remain with us. That it's much easier to roll a ball down a hill than it is to push it back up again. That the amount of energy necessary to reconstruct a polity that has been atomized is uh, much greater than what it was to sort of take a relatively healthy social order in the beginning and extract individualism out of that order. So I have you know, some degree of uh, skepticism about uh, any number of questions. I was very heartened to hear Angela talk about Moral Mondays. That could very well be a great model for the future of our republic. But I do wonder, because of course, Moral Mondays uh, has that M word, moral. And if you go into many communities in America and you talk about something moral, uh, you'll be met with a shiver. Uh, this is true certainly among uh, certain kinds of progressives, but it's also true among uh, many libertarians, many uh, sorts of economic conservatives and others. Um, I can relate perhaps a uh, somewhat pessimistic vision of about 14 years ago. I took a trip, uh, a junket actually, to Switzerland with a number of Americans uh, of various backgrounds. And we were all there to learn about uh, the Swiss Republic and its um, parallels with the United States. Um, <clears throat> on this trip were a number of <clears throat> conservatives and libertarians, but also a number of uh, progressives, uh, Democrats from different parts of the country. And it was very interesting to me to discover that some of the differences between uh, the uh, Western Democrats, a, a white Democrat from, uh, from out West, and an inner city Democrat from Cleveland, who was black, uh, were in fact as dramatic as any differences between uh, you know, the, the left and the right in a, a formalistic sense. So when the uh, black Democrat from Cleveland uh, spoke at one dinner about how important his faith was to him as a Democrat and as an American, uh, the uh, female uh, white uh, Democrat from uh, the West uh, turned uh, to someone nearby her and said uh, that this did not reflect her vision of the Democratic Party at all. So I do worry that um, you know, if you talk about uh, something like the uh, Moral Mondays, that might work in, uh, in uh, North Carolina, um, but is it going to work necessarily in other parts? Um, and I, I think I have some reason for skepticism. Now, on the other hand, there's something to be said for a kind of federalism here, that if Moral Mondays is a good formula for North Carolina, it doesn't mean it has to have the, uh, the same language or the same approach, in, uh, whether it's in Arizona or in California or anywhere else. So perhaps federalism is going to help su su bridge some of the gap here uh, between very different kinds of cultures. But one of the uh, missing terms in, uh, I think, uh, most discussions of identity politics is the flip side, is the idea of majoritarianism. And uh, for so much of America's history, until you know, basically just the past few years, uh, America has had a political majority that could also be very easily identified as a certain kind of religious majority and a certain kind of ethnic majority as well. Uh, America had a you know, white Christian majority and this necessarily lent a certain, um, uh, you know, sort of Christian and, in some cases, self-interested, in many cases, self-interested white perspective uh, to our politics. Um, so even if we talk about the Roosevelt Dispensation, I think the critique that identity politics partisans would make of the Roosevelt Dispensation, and you heard this from Angela to some extent, uh, you know, someone like uh, Martin Luther King was considered uh, much too radical by many, even on the left, uh, in his own time, and certainly figures who were more radical than King uh, were considered entirely, uh, you know, unacceptable, and uh, were subject to all kinds of, you know, COINTELPRO and uh, various other programs to uh, sort of keep them down. Uh, they were encouraged to, you know, sort of emigrate to Africa and to start start revolutions there. Um, so th the idea of majoritarianism, which is essential if you're going to have a democratic republic such as the United States, um, is a complicated idea. It's not just a political idea, but it's an idea that tends to have implications uh, with respect to ethnicity, with respect to religion, and in other uh, respects as well. If we have um, uh, you know, a, a case in identity politics or from identity politics, which may be exaggerated, which may be wrong, but which also has a certain degree of justice to it, that complicates the idea of majoritarianism. It complicates the idea that you're going to be able to stitch back together uh, some sort of large enough coalition to have, as Patrick said, a common good. 
If you don't have these other elements, if you don't have family, if you don't have faith, it can be very hard to see what a purely political common good would be, or even if you could devise such a thing intellectually, how you would succeed in selling it to people emotionally. And I think that's one of the sort of um, the failures of a uh, sort of uh, advanced uh, progressive intellectual elite, which may have a very uh, attractive idea of what the common good would be in a philosophical or political abstract way, but who nonetheless can't connect with their voters. You see this on the right as well, that they, um, a number of Christian conservatives were very shocked to find out uh, that they were leading you know, organizations of other Christian conservatives, and yet their own grassroots supporters were more inclined to vote for Donald Trump than to vote for a candidate who seemed to have a more direct moral appeal. Donald Trump being you know, a uh, quite uh, outrageously uh, non-moral, to put it uh, delicately, uh, kind of candidate. Um, but I think this too just goes to show that um, we are dealing with uh, so much complexity here and such a loss of sort of older standards and norms uh, that there's very little chance of recovering them either by drawing just upon the idea of citizenship or drawing just upon the idea of religion. Now, Mark Lilla's remarks brought up something that may be an alternative to either religion or um, citizenship just by themselves. Uh, and I, I don't mean to suggest that Angela was just saying that religion by itself or morality by itself was the sort of basis of Moral Mondays. I, I'm just saying for the sake of argument, if you reduce uh, the arguments and make that the sort of, um, you know, is this necessary and sufficient, is this enough, uh, there are reasons to think it might not be. But in addition to religion, in addition to uh, morals, and um, in addition to uh, citizenship, there's also the idea of economics. And Mark Lilla said that perhaps economic nationalism is uh, the basis that the right will use in the future uh, to build a, um, you know, if not a majority, at least a plurality that's capable of wielding power. Uh, I suspect that is very much going to be the case. Um, and, uh, you know, I've. Uh, I've heard from a number of people, including Steve Bannon, who have this vision. Um, it's a more inclusive vision than you might expect in some respects. Um, Steve Bannon thinks that uh, there is certainly a large segment of the black vote to be won with a thoroughly economic nationalist appeal. And uh, there's some anecdotal evidence to suggest that. And um, e economics really does matter. It's something that I think uh, would not be surprising to a Marxist, uh, but it would be very surprising to, uh, you know, sort of many Americans uh, in politics who've been thinking purely in moralistic terms or purely in terms, well, I mean, citizenship and religion are both, uh, have a tendency to kind of escape from concrete reality and to become invested with kind of utopian ideas of uh, simply human goodness and how we're going to mitigate sin and so forth. When in fact, a lot of politics is really brutally uh, interest-based and brutally sort of um, realistic. And that requires a uh, sort of um, a keen handle on uh, economics and how to actually provide benefits to different groups of people. Uh, I've been fond of saying that in some respects, economic nationalism shouldn't be understand just as econ uh, understood just as economic nationalism. It's rather also economic federalism. It's about making sure that the agricultural sector, the industrial sector, as well as the service sector, as well as the financial sector, that all of these things are well served. It's about making sure that we have economic policies that are suitable for the post-industrial rust belt, as well as being suitable for the uh, rather free trade loving American South. I think if you have that kind of patchwork approach, you can at least stitch together a political coalition that may be capable of winning and wielding power. But even that, I think, would fall short of being the old kind of united majority uh, that you used to have in this country. Now, I do see uh, throughout the world, there do seem to be a rise of um, political coalitions on the right that involve an integration of nationalism and of religious fervor. And you see this uh, across different civilizational boundaries, if we may still use such an archaic uh, idea. Uh, you see this, for example, in Modi's India. You see it in Erdogan's Turkey. You see it uh, in Hungary under Orban. You see it in Russia with Putin. Uh, you see it in Israel with Likud. Uh, in all of these places, there seems to be a tremendous amount of political power being wielded by groups which are able to bring together um, sort of old-fashioned, in some ways, ideas of faith and nationhood. And it's not a pretty picture in many of these places, or in most of these places. Uh, it's something that I think is deeply troubling to Americans, especially Americans of a, broadly speaking, liberal bent. 
Uh, and yet, um, it seems to me that liberalism by itself, just like citizenship in the abstract or morality or religion in the abstract, is simply um, too weak a read on which to build a uh, successful political coalition or a successful um, sort of operative approach to uh, bringing about the common good. That you actually do need a little bit of this um, uh, sort of uh, flesh and blood, um, and I don't mean that in any kind of you know, ethnic or racial sense, I just mean in a, a tactile sense of really understanding the groups and the interests within the country. You have to bring them all together uh, in a material way as well as in a spiritual way, uh, as in a, uh, a concrete economic way as well as in a political and a philosophical way. Uh, I think the right is slowly developing a vision of this, and it's very messy. It's something that uh, you know, naturally uh, provokes quite a lot of um, sort of horrified reaction, uh, but it is happening. And if you're on the right, you want to see that develop in a way that is um, morally good rather than uh, you know, sort of playing to the worst instincts of humanity. And if you're on the left, I think you want to counter it with a vision that also has as much concrete economic appeal and concrete uh, ability to um, bring together the ideas of nation and of religion and of uh, interest uh, that you see the right trying to formulate both here and abroad. So with those uh, general remarks, I will conclude and uh, pass it on to Karen. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin with a thank you and a confession. The thank you goes to Gleaves Whitney, Scott St. Louis, and the entire staff at the Howenstein Center for organizing and inviting me to participate in this lively and provocative discussion. The confession uh, is that I may be precisely the kind of identity conscious liberal about whom Mark Lilla harbors serious concerns. I teach courses on the ways in which Notions of gender, race, and sexuality are woven into the very fabric of our national consciousness and produce inequalities, the roots of which are often obscured. I study the ways in which identity is implicated in suffering and injustice, as well as marshaled successfully to mitigate these. And I chair a political organization that is unabashed in its efforts to bring attention to the way gender matters to electoral politics. Sorry. Um, <laughs> You know, according to Mark Lilla, I, along with plenty of other academics and social movement activists on the left, have helped create the political crisis we find ourselves in today. On Lilla's account, the political left has become so preoccupi preoccupied with identity-based divisions that we've forgotten what it means to be citizens and how to envision a shared way of life. We've abdicated our responsibility for uniting, inspiring, mobilizing. Instead, we've embraced what he calls a pseudo-politics of self-regard, that is, in his language, increasingly narrow and exclusionary. Solve the problem, he exhorts us to put aside our attention to difference and focus on what we share as citizens, as you heard. This, he believes, is the key to winning the kind of political power necessarily to right this ship. And so while I agree with Lilla that we need to cultivate a richer civic spirit and a commitment to the, to the flourishing of all, and that electing the right people to political office is an absolutely essential component of that project, I see no reason to think that identity politics must work against that. In fact, there are many reasons to appreciate the ongoing importance of identity to the project of cultivating a more, rust, a more robust vision and practice of the public good. And I actually think we heard pieces of that depending on what you define as identity, whether you think about it in terms of race or you think about it in terms of a kind of class identity. So my, the, my remarks are going to focus on what the heck do we mean when we say identity or identity politics? Because I think it's pretty clear, at least to me, that Lilla and I don't understand it the same way. The narrative that he tells us, I believe, erases a complicated history of analysis um, and organizing by marginalized individuals and groups and leaves us with a series of misconceptions that may undermine our ability to envision and engender the more just and equitable society he hopes we inhabit in the future. So I'm gonna give you three misconceptions. I may run through them a little bit quickly in the interest of time, and I'm happy to expand on them in the Q&A. The first misconception I think we have here is that identity politics is not a winning political strategy as evidenced by the outcomes of the 2016 election. Well, to buy into that misconception, we would have to believe that Hillary Clinton lost the election and the Democratic Party is out of power because of the left's concern with issues of identity. And it's to disregard some pretty important facts. Fact one, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by 2.5, more than 2.5 million votes. President Trump's electoral college victory hung on a mere 80,000 votes cast in three states and he got a smaller share of the popular vote than Mitt Romney. 
It also requires us to believe that Obama voters jump ship in mass because they yearn for a different meaning, a different message. But the fact is, Obama to Trump voters account for a small perception, a small percentage of Clinton's lost or missing constituency, and that percentage is actually less than the co combined percentage of Obama voters who sat out the election or voted for a third party candidate. So that may be a place where we think about what kind of work we need to do on the left. It also requires us to believe that Trump's base is composed of working class white voters who represent some generic or ideal type of citizen. And the facts here are that Trump voters were predominantly affluent Republicans and that American citizenship has always been defined through exclusions based on racial and gender difference. Unfortunately, this data doesn't figure largely into Lilla's story, nor does the influence of dark money, extreme ger gerrymandering, Russian bots, media consolidation. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't deep divisions in this country, nor am I saying that identity is a pure political good. My point is simply to question the contention that identity politics, as embraced by the left, cause major shifts in voting patterns, or that the election results are some referendum on the political efficacy of identity politics. Misconception number two, identity politics isn't real politics. It's navel-gazing narcissism, a turning inward that makes one incapable of seeing beyond oneself and unwilling to engage in the difficult work of building coalitions and mobilizing. And here I think, and I share with Angela, this in incredible, um, optimism and faith in the students I have in front of me in the classroom because this does not describe them in any way. Now identity politics is not, or at least doesn't have to be, about narcissism and navel gazing. And this is particularly true of the radical black feminists who coined the term, or perhaps, perhaps they didn't coin the term, in 1977. And here I reference the Kambahi River, uh, River Collective Statement. In the book, Lilla uses a two-line quote from it to launch a series of sweeping attacks on decades-long efforts to make sense of the complexity and intransigence of inequalities that disproportionately affect those who inhabit non-male and non-white bodies. So I want to take a closer look at the statement itself. Because there, I think, we find an effort to make visible particularly particular experiences of, of oppression an effort to understand how systems of power create and deploy identity in ways that make life precarious for certain people, and to envision and enact a response to those injustices in ways that are not navel-gazing, in ways that are um, meant to uh, address issues of the complexity of injustice, and in ways that are meant to, to uh, advance an effort to build coalition and think in terms of solidarity. So the statement isn't focused on discovering some nugget of truth about one's essential identity, Instead, it offers a thoughtful analysis of interlocking oppression. Now, to be sure, the collective argues that a radical politics derives from the, spe the specificities of a person's experience. But what is that experience? That was the experience of a complex mix of racism, sexism, homophobia, and economic exploitation. So for the, for the River Collective, no analysis or response to the problem of inequality would be complete without attention to socioeconomic factors and material conditions. At the same time, no attention to economic inequality would be complete without attention to structures of racial and gender di discrimination. Here are their words, quote, we need to articulate the real class situation of persons who are not merely raceless, sexless workers, but for whom racial and sexual oppression are significant determinants in their working economic lives. And I think this is one of the things we're seeing in the Me Too movement. Right? It makes a difference where you work to how sexual harassment and sexual violence is perpetrated, and it makes a difference where you work and what color uh, what color your skin is, to what the possibilities are for responding to that. Now, unfortunately, this was not something others were willing to acknowledge at the time. As the collective explains, they needed to articulate and build a specific kind of politics rooted in their experiences because no other organization would do it. Their words again, all the political movements that have preceded us believe that anyone is more worthy of liberation than ourselves. Nonetheless, this disregard did not stop the collective from working to build coalition with others around common causes like reproductive freedom, low wages, workplace safety. Their goal was freeing all persons from the constraints of capitalism and patriarchy, and they knew that achieving this goal required uh, engagement in 
the messy world of politics. This wasn't about consciousness raising and emotional support alone. That was important, but not enough. And when they um, found a political strategy that they thought was working, that still was not enough. We are committed to a continual examination of our politics as they develop through criticism and self-criticism as an essential aspect of our practice. Right? This ongoing effort to say what is working, what isn't working, which context is it working, which it, is it working in, which context is it not working in. Who do we build coalition with around this particular issue? Maybe that we build coalition with a different group of people around a different group of issues. If this is the quintessential uh, um, description of identity politics, or this is the birthplace of identity politics as it is in the narrative that um, Mark Lilla explains, well then I think we need to appreciate that it's a much more complex and interesting and provocative and potentially useful version of identity politics than the one we traditionally talk about. So misconception number three, which has been addressed. Identity politics has created a, a generation of young people who are, according to Lilla, quote, unprepared to think about the common good and what must be done practically to secure it. As he says, we don't need more marchers, we need more mayors. Now I imagine or hope that he would want to revise this assessment in the wake of daily headlines that announce the record-breaking number of women, many of them quite young, and, repre and representative of non-white populations who are running for office. As of April 10th, 309 women have filed to run for seats in the House, 29 are running for Senate, 40 for governorships. And in all cases, this represents a significant increase for, from 2016. And these women will go to different kinds of campaign training schools and programs that bring women together, but bring women together across party lines and to think about how you talk about common goods like healthcare, uh, public education, uh, clean water, but do it in a way that recognizes that different people who inhabit different communities and live in different bodies experience these goods or the lack of these goods in significantly different ways. So I think about the gun control debate we were, ha were having today and I think, okay, so maybe there is some general agreement that we need to have safer schools. And maybe, and I don't agree with this, but maybe we agree that safer, well, Let's say we agree we need safer schools. One of the proposals out there is that we put more law enforcement in these schools. But a, uh, a, an analysis of the issue that is um, motivated by, by the kinds of questions that the Kambahi River Collective asked would remind us that putting more law enforcement or more guns in schools puts children of color at risk in a way that it does not put white children at risk, particularly boys. So I think that the kind of candidates we're going to be seeing in th this next election, I don't know that we'll see them you know, in 2020 or 20, uh, going forward, but in this next election, I think the candidates we'll see are more likely to understand that even if we agree on a problem, that we need to take into consideration the specificities of identity in terms of thinking about the uh, solutions to these problems. So let me end by responding to Mark Lilla's call for a new vision for the future. From my perspective, the future of the Democratic Party or the political left or whatever we want to call it does not require a radical break from its past if that past is understood as including a commitment to addressing intersectional inequality. And my reading of the past is that this commitment is there. So don't get me wrong, there's plenty we need to improve upon. And, uh, you know, and the Democratic Party and our students and progressives and liberals and the right, we all make mistakes that become the caricature and the, 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 the reason for indicting an entire uh, movement group of people who are radically different in, in some ways. So I think the Kambahi River Collection's call for critical self-reflection on practice is as important now as it was in the late 1970s. But the present is already showing us an identity conscious polit political practice committed to the common good. We are marching and running for office. We are talking about common goods while also acknowledging the way in which institutions work to adversely affect more, uh, some more than others. We're building coalitions around initiatives like voting rights that take account of the different barriers that rural whites might face versus African Americans living in Detroit might face to, to ac exercising their voting rights. So it seems to me that we can be social justice warriors 
and savvy political actors. Indeed, we already are. Should I just go up? Oh, no. Is this still working? Yeah. Well, um, I can imagine pursuing any of these conversations that um, the panelists have started uh, for the next uh, hour or so, each one. Uh, but instead, I'm going to take, um, I can only follow Yogi Berra's advice that if you come to a fork in the road, take it. So I'm going to, rather than follow the four, I'm simply going to make a couple of remarks grouping um, uh, Angela and, and Karen's remarks first and then Patrick and Dan's. Um, one thing I have to say that I've learned in talking about the book uh, that I generally learned and hadn't understood before, and had I understood it, I would have written different parts of the book differently, having to do with uh, race and gender. What the Me Too movement you know, has helped make clearer to me is that there are two things going on politically in this country at once. One is a cultural revolution. We are in the middle of a cultural revolution that is a kind of reckoning, uh, a reckoning with America's racial history, a reckoning for ways in which um, uh, women are still discriminate, discriminated against and uh, abused. And so it, it's like a series of wake-up calls at the cultural level. And you can argue about, you know, how to rea you know whether the reaction has been too much or the wrong way or whatever, but basically it's a good and important thing in a democratic society. But that not only has nothing to do with institutional politics, but given where we are in the country right now, f f using the language and the focus that one uses in this cultural revolution and trying to uh, apply it to electoral politics is suicidal. You do not convince someone to vote for you by asking them to fall on their knees and confess their sins. Now that may be necessary in American history and in American society, especially with regards to race. But you do not do that when you are trying to seize and hold institutional power. You must find another way to get people to join you. So I, I guess what, what I learned is that um, I, I oppose these things a little too much rather than seeing, uh, as if one had to choose, rather than trying to see that um, we're trying to do two things at once and these two aims are conflicting with each other because they require different kinds of speech and different kinds of action. So for example, and it also means if you, I mean, uh, the Moral Mondays movement, what Danielle Allen has said about, uh, about building bridges, all of that is very important in changing hearts and minds. But the Republicans did not get, what they, get where they are and have not transformed this country by saving souls. They have done it by, in two ways, one, they had a vision. Republicans did not seize power by thinking of how are we going to complexify our views of issues, as Karen has suggested. How are we going to find new ways to build coalitions? Reagan's genius is that he got the Republicans out of the mentality of coalition politics by giving a vision, a narrative, a simple one in which these very different factions on the right, social conservatives, economic conservatives, libertarians, and the rest, could somehow recognize themselves in this man and in that message. 
It is that that I'm talking about that the Democrats lack, is that they think in terms of groups and think in terms of coalitions and are unable to say what we believe. What are the principles that are inspiring all our concerns about these groups? And how do we convey that to the American public and persuade them that they ought to be their principles too? Um, so, uh, you know, and that, and, and that kind of practical politics is that sense of practical politics, especially I didn't hear in Karen's remarks, actually does worry me. And yes, I do believe it is the problem. 20% of the American public, one out of five Amer adult Americans, considers himself or herself an evangelical. One third of 1% 1 of the American public is transgender. To judge by the energies put into issues and the prominence of various issues, you would not, uh, that, uh, and the emphasis that Democrats put not only in politics, but also in, in, in culture. You know, to judge by Hollywood television shows, you would think that 20% of the country was transgender, and there are no evangelical characters at all on American television. It's one out of five Americans. That is how detached the liberal mentality has become from what the country is, but also about the job that needs to be done. What I say in the book, and I'll just repeat the statistics here, it's not a question of national elections and how did Hillary lose. There are a thousand reasons why, well, she, she won the election, which is right, but why she uh, did not assume the presidency. That was not what I talked about at all. This has been coming for since the 1980s. The um, Democratic Party and liberals withdrawing from, from the democratic task of offering a vision of our principles and the country we want to build. Republicans hold two-thirds of the state houses in America. They control two-thirds of the governorships. They control, control 25 states outright. Very soon, if they wish to, if they win more state legislatures, they could call a constitutional convention. If that is not the first thing you think about, and not the first thing that orients your political activity as a liberal, you're dreaming. You have been defeated. You have been kicked around. There are swaths of the country where you cannot show your face. So the talk about what we're going to do for this group and that group and everything is beside the point. You cannot protect African Americans in Mississippi until you can talk to white Mississippians and convince them to vote for you. Supreme Court decisions won't do that. A new president won't do that. You must go there. And you must find a language that appeals to them and show that they have common cause with African Americans who suffer different problems. All right, now for, um, uh, and Dan and Patrick, it was very different, for different sorts of remarks, um, but um, it was interesting to my mind contrasting them, and I was interested by uh, Dan's uh, sort of, uh, you know, indirect remarks on what Patrick had said. Um, it's easy to get into a game where a group of people realize that we become individualistic in this country, and the conservative will say, well, liberals have done this because of they've broken up the family and they've broken up all these other things, when in fact this is happening everywhere else in the world as well. Or someone on the left will say, what's well, economics? People are impoverished right now and all the rest, right? What, I've tried, what I'm suggesting is that the individualism that has grown up is somehow closer to Tocqueville, somehow in, not only in the DNA of the United States, but there is something happen, happening globally. Families around the world are getting smaller everywhere. Attachments to religion is declining everywhere. Um, uh, civic commitment is declining everywhere. We are becoming a more atomized world due to economic forces and cultural ideas. 
And so it's simply romantic to think that somehow what we have to do is to go back to something. That's not how history ever works. It's true one can get out of the way. And that's why I'm very sympathetic to those conservatives, uh, reformacons, some of them are called, who simply want to get the government out of the way when local organizations can do things or help encourage them to build up these little platoons in society because those are also schools for citizenship. I agree with all of that. But there are deep forces in world history that are making this the world that we, we have in front of us. And to talk simply about uh, liberalism as being uh, uh, and liberal ideas as being the cause of this, I, I think is in incorrect. And there's always a suspicion when I hear that, that I start smelling incense coming in under the door and people whispering in Latin in the other room, right? As if we're supposed to go back to you know, the Catholic Church or something like that. These are deep forces in the world. And so I was more sympathetic to what Dan was saying um, and uh, saying that you know, we, we have to think about what Marx did. I, that's absolutely right, that Marx was interested in explaining the nexus between economic relations, cultural norms and ideas, and political structure. And we are looking for a new, though doubtless quite different, Karl Marx. Uh, whether economic nationalism will, uh, for the right, provide a way of, of moving forward on this, I don't know. Because what I'm talking about is not appealing to people's economic interest, but appealing to duty. So you would say that in the face of it, is an appeal to citizen, citizenship enough in the face of these forces, social and historical forces? The answer is no. Nothing's ever enough in life, and certainly in politics. But you do what you can. But the degree to which these more natural and earlier social attachments disappear, and they cannot be wished away, then it seems to me the only alternative is to try to emphasize a bond that is actually real in there. We actually are citizens. So that's the best response I can offer, and it's totally inadequate, but thanks. Should I stay here for... So I guess we're all supposed to take questions, and if there are questions for me or anyone on the panel. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone here for elevating the level of discourse in this country on a day when the president called a longtime civil servant a lying slime ball, and one of his supporters called an even a longer serving civil servant the moral equivalent of Joseph Stalin. So none of those things were said tonight, and I really appreciate that. We haven't but, started drinking yet. That's true. <laughs> but I, I have to admit, I, I simply, I think there's a certain level of obtuseness present here and throughout the country when I hear this insistent claim that the left has no message that it agrees upon. Since, we're, since everyone's been quoting Tocqueville tonight, I guess I'll do that too. Tocqueville also said about Americans that Americans love liberty, but they are obsessed with equality. They would rather be equally free, but if necessary, they will be equal in servitude. I think that that's, a, that, that's not a very ennobling vision, the second part of that. <laughs> but I think that the, that the left message is simply equality. But that equality, as every child who ever had siblings knows, is not the same thing as same treatment or sameness. Everyone who's, who heard their mother say, yes, I gave your sister or brother more than you, but you have different needs, and I love you all equally. <laughs> Everyone knows that difference is part of equality. And I think what part of the, what the left is doing today is saying before we can understand what equality means, we have to understand what differences there are. And I think that that's, that's a legitimate part of our political discourse today. And it's not, it's not necessarily narcissism. It's a commitment to equality that Tocqueville and every American, beginning with James Madison onward, has understood has to coexist with difference and faction and contestation. And I don't think that that's 
so much different today, except that we have a president who's not going to, not Grover, Grover Norquist wanted to shrink government so he could, to the size that he could drown it in a bathtub. I think perhaps our president wants to drown it in the gutter and is doing a pretty good job. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll just quickly get started and anyone can jump in. Um, Reflecting on the relation between equality and difference is an excellent theme for a seminar. You do not run for office on it. You do not develop a vision on it. When you talk about equality, you're absolutely right. Americans don't, now don't like the word equality, right? So let's say solidarity, right? Now, we can talk about, on the stump, what solidarity would mean for you and what it would mean for you, and we need probably to understand something about that. But we're moving in the wrong direction if we're constantly moving down and trying to disaggregate what's going on and how people are affected. We are at a moment when we should be aggregating, speaking more abstractly, in a way that's inspiring. Um, so while I agree with the uh, necessity of thinking through all of that, at the level of politi political rhetoric, you need one word or you need two words. Reagan stole freedom from us. He stole liberty from us. Those used to be our words. Now we need a word or two and to build what we stand for and what we're working for around large themes. Um, so the public intellectual I am surprised that has not been brought up tonight is Richard Rorty because much of your analysis maps onto his diagnosis of the reformist left to the cultural left and that there is a sort of ignorance in the cultural left today on many economic issues surrounding the liberal party that we are not paying attention to and that we must be paying attention to. Although I believe that the cultural left kind of gets at more of the nuances of the certain economic issues that we're facing today. And that there are deep rooted issues in the economy that has to do with identity in America. And that has to do with self-expression in America. And I just kind of wanted to get at a lot of the term that I've been thinking about recently in my own research is freedom. And that hasn't been discussed here a lot tonight either. And I just wanted, I guess, anyone's opinion on how freedom is rooted in either our cultural movements, in our reformist movements, in our self-identity, and what type of freedom that we are losing almost in today's administration, and what type of freedom that we have to protect in our future, whether that be freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of political choice, freedom of economic choice. There are just so many different types to be concerned with, and I think we're kind of hinting at a lot of it, but I just wanted to hear a few of your opinions on that. Anybody? Well, I think, you know, I, I appreciate um, the idea, you know, about, let me back up, um, putting freedom on the floor and in the room. I, I think that's really important. But I think, like, choice, there's so many of these terms. I think what's really tricky for us is that, you know, we, we're, we're kind of divided by a common language, right? I mean, that, that the content of that can look so radically different based on where you stand politically, socially, economically, you know, kind of what does freedom mean, you know, for an impoverished family, right? I mean, I, you know, so it's, I think those terms are really tricky and I've been, you know, kind of thinking about the, the previous question of, about um, equality. Um, I would probably use equity, right? That the, the kind of one side says that it's, it's, it's equity that's most important, mm -hmm. the other side has tended um, to protect and valorize ideas about inequality or hierarchy, right? That, that these things produce positive goods in society, right? And that that's one way of thinking about the long history of political debate um, in, inside the United States. So I think you're right about some of those terms. I think you know they're really good to reflect on. I don't know that those will get us out of the weeds, though, right? Because then we just start fighting over, well, what, what do you really mean by freedom at the end of the day? Um, I also kind of appreciate that, you know, trying to bring it back to a really practical politics. And one of the things that I really appreciate about what um, 
uh, Reverend Barber and others are up to, especially in, in North Carolina, and as they're trying to spread this movement, is to really call attention to um, gerrymandering. Right, and what's going on in terms of people's votes, right? So we can all kind of agree that voting is an important <coughs> part of being a citizen, right, of being an American. Um, and you know, that to really point out to people, and, and Barbara is really brilliant about this, and you know, I was kind of thinking about this um, when, when Dan was talking about a kind of white identity that just kind of gets to be out there and kind of normalized, right, without much interrogation. So one of the things that they do is to say, look, because of gerrymandering to the white population in places like North Carolina, that your vote doesn't matter either. So you should stand in solidarity with African Americans who've had that experience, right? And that we're kind of all in the same boat, all in the same boat in a really practical, really grounded kind of way in which the right to vote um, that, that kind of understanding of, of, of freedom and citizenship is in fact being structurally denied right, to, to whole parts of the population and that you try and root it in those kinds of moments right, in which you, you kind of drill down on well, what is it that you really mean by some of these larger, um, more lofty terms. Is that a good, that's not a good, you don't look convinced. It's just kind of like, I don't know what she's no. talking about. <laughs> no, I, I understand. I completely, yes, because yeah. it is it's difficult to nail down exactly yeah. what we mean by freedom and the difference between freedom and liberty and freedom and action and political action. It is definitely an entire panel Absolutely. on its own. I just to understand that what we're here to do today is to make common ground mm -hmm. and that maybe if not in a certain type of freedom that the left, the right, conservative, liberal, we can all agree that a certain type of freedom of our own person is being is being denied to us, whether that be for, I know a lot of conservatives, the freedom to own guns, or for a lot of liberals, the freedom of identity. It's the main root of all of our arguments resides, in my opinion, in freedom, and that it is being denied, and that from freedom in Hannah Arendt's view, that we are here in existence as a plurality. That is the entirety of the human condition, is that we live on earth with other men, men, and that we are here for one another, and the fact of politics is, is for us to express our own freedom, and right now that is entirely being denied to us as citizens, is that we have no way to take that back. If that makes more sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm, my name is Michelle Nickerson. I'm participating in the events this weekend, and- is um, it, Can people hear? No. no, is that microphone on? You wanna tap it? Can okay. you hear me now? Yeah, just gotta get closer. <laughs> okay. Um, I am, I am very interested uh, and, in what you have to say about um, the importance of power in institutional politics. And it's something that I'm thinking about all the time um, in, uh, well, when I'm preparing um, for the upcoming elections uh, and, and constantly. Um, but I, like, to follow up on, um, what Professor Dillard, for example, was just saying, I can't help but wonder what you have to, what, what you think, for example, about um, the importance of uh, movements for electoral, like a, a case we're talking about the relationship between certain movements and institutional political reform. Uh, I think the gerrymandering cases are one of the most important cases in point, um, where it's going to take probably grassroots organizations, think about what's happening in Pennsylvania, who are going to bring uh, political reform, p possibly through courts, in order to change the electoral map. When, for, when the institutions themselves do not allow for the kind of possibilities um, that you need for Republican democracy to operate all the time. So movements themselves develop in order to adjust the institutions. I mean, isn't that the dialect that's always been there from the very beginning? And so how can they exist without each other? How can the institutions exist without the movements? I'll let you take uh, over from there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, you haven't mentioned parties. And, um, you know, it's a democrat democratic way of thinking um, that um, we're both going to, we're going to be coalition and, and uh, it's going to come from the grassroots and there are going to be movements. And it's true that uh, movements are fantastic at mobilizing people. That is certainly the case. And uh, also around various different kinds of groups. But just ask yourself a simple question. How did the Republicans get where they are right now? Was it through movements? It was not. How did it happen? It happened through an ideology that crystallized the vision they wanted, going out to every little town in the country and showing up with that message, and it meant discipline in a party where everyone was on message. Oh, right. oh, yes, but it wasn't a plurality of movements is what I'm saying, sure. But, but they're coalesced a kind of, you know, fusionism as it's called, an ideology that came together uh, and that Reagan was able to express, but it was a movement around ideas. It was not around various different constituencies. That's the difference, right? And gerrymandering is one of the greatest outrages in American politics today, there's no doubt about it, but how do we get in that position? By not putting our energy into state races and places where we couldn't talk to people. That's how it happened. And that's gotta change. Last two questions, David, and then Paul. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Professor Lilla, right at the end of your uh, response, you discussed the phenomenon of the little platoons yeah. and the desire on the part of many conservatives just to have government get out of the way. And uh, you, you express some sympathy to that. And yet it seems to be very different from the vision that you articulate on a couple levels. One where you say you can't, and I hope I'm quoting you correctly, or at least paraphrasing you correctly, you can't accomplish anything unless you're in power. Whereas if you're in a little platoon, regardless of who's in power, as long as they don't take away too many of your rights, you can have, you can accomplish quite a bit within your little platoon. Um, also, and this here, I'm quoting your famous New York Times article regarding uh, Roosevelt, listening to Roosevelt's stirring voice as he invoked the freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. Freedoms that Roosevelt demanded for, quote, everyone in the world, unquote. I was reminded of what the real foundations of modern American liberalism are. And I was struck regarding Roosevelt's four freedoms, uh, the degree to which government coercion is absolutely necessary to accomplish the final two, and as well as the whole idea of for everyone in the world, and the idea of government intervention abroad to accomplish that. Perhaps a vision that united at least some Democrats and Republicans throughout the 20th century. Um, but I wonder, given the emphasis of this conference on common ground, what common ground can truly be achieved through government coercion? Uh, well, of course, the phrase coercion is, is a very loaded term, isn't it? If you, you know, you think about coercion if you think that there's a priority of individuals and who is this goddamn government coming here and coercing me. I'm talking about thinking of a collectivity. We are a society. We make collective decisions, right? And we do that uh, through consensus. We do that through argument. We do that through debate. You know, in a way, I mean, I didn't use the term because it doesn't resonate with the public. I'm a kind of civic Republican, you know, and, um, and so believe that there's a priority of our <coughs> collective being. And that also could be a very conservative principle. So it's not coercion if we're collectively and legitimately debating these things. But I think underlying your question is something else that can show up sometimes and uh, in conservative discourse about these things, and that's a kind of American exceptionalism, 
Look, individualism is developing everywhere in the world. So there's got to be a deeper thing that is at work. We have modern industrial, post-industrial information economies. As the world becomes more connected, we will need more government, not less. It's not because they're pointed headed liberals in America who are pushing for it. The age demands it. Wilson was right about this stuff, and I know he's a bugbear for a lot of conservatives right now, but he was absolutely right about that. And, um, you know, we need, in a modern economy, we need an educated, healthy workforce. And uh, so that becomes a priority. So we can't wish away any of these things or think that America is either an exception or that these problems are because, exceptionally in America, we've made a mad decision because of liberal decisions or conservative decisions. We need to spend more time understanding these deeper currents in history that have landed not only us, but the whole developed world and increasingly the developing world in the same boat. Thank you. I just want to raise something I think that hasn't been out there enough. Uh, Ronald Reagan may have won because he had some centralizing message, some two words or whatever you're encouraging the left to take on. But I don't think that's why Donald Trump won. I think Donald mm -hmm. Trump didn't go out and, and unite, a, unite everybody mm -hmm. around a common vision of citizenry. I think that what he won with was a lot of celebrity, irreverence, appealing to people's ignorance, appealing to, to identity politics. I, and I, I feel like if there's a recipe for the Democrats winning next time, it isn't some sort of two-word slogan. It's getting a cage fighter and having him insult everybody. And that's where I think we haven't really faced with what, what helped Donald Trump win. It wasn't hope and change. It was, it was being nasty and, and misleading a lot of people. So I'm not sure what you would really expect the logical democratic response to be, but I don't think it's you know a two-word slogan appealing to citizenry. Well, uh, I certainly don't think, and I write about this in the book, as you'll learn when you buy it outside on the way out, they take, or they take v, or they take Visa, Mastercard, and American Express. Um, that um, no, that the Reagan vision is over, and Trump is does not have a vision. And so there is a vision vacuum, so to speak, in this country. And that's why it's an opportunity for Democrats and liberals to get back in the business of reimagining what the common picture of the country and the common destiny that we want to create for each other and for ourselves, right? And either Democrats are going to get there first or Republicans are going to get there first. Uh, or we're going to be without one. But Possibly, po possibly. But, but I guess my, my hope, I mean a little bit of hope I have in this is that Americans are craving still a sense of vision and a sense of national destiny together. But that there is none that on offer and certainly none that's compelling on either side, which is why we have him. Dan, did you want to respond to that? I, oh, I think Karen was I'd asked. like to. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, one of, one of the places in the book that I like that I wanted you to say more about was when you talk about what went into the creation of the vision, right? It's, it's 40 years in the making through the creation of think tanks that then put out papers, that then go around, that then perform street theater, that, that then get funded by incredible swaths of money, that then get promoted through enormous evangelical churches. So I, I really think that if what, you, if what we're gonna talk about is, is what kind, I, I don't think we can even get to the message yet in some ways until we understand like the mechanisms of the performative politics that has to, that, that takes time, that takes repetition, uh, that takes infrastructure, that takes institutions. So I think I might have been more open to, you know, sort of embracing your call for a vision if we were, we were um, really grappling with what, all of what goes into creating that vision and, in, and then recognizing that that creation of that vision may be precisely at odds with what we think of as individual freedom or you know, individual creativity. So I think that there, there are some tensions in the book between, right, we want to seize political power, but at what, to what, at, at, at what cost? Um, so 
I, I wanted to know if you would, would have added more to that piece of the, the book. If, if you well, I, I guess I'm more worried about the cost of not holding power, that's for sure. Um, but um, no, you're right. I mean, these things take time, and we have lost four decades by not focusing on this. Our think tanks are not like the machines in Washington on the right. There are summer schools for young conservatives. Uh, there are reading groups run by the Liberty Fund. There are magazines and a serious exploration of ideas on the right that all contributed to this, right? And then it became a well-oiled machine and now has all sorts of problems. But we wasted four decades by, not think, by thinking we didn't have to do exactly that. Thanks, Karen. Let's give Mark Lovelock a chance. Okay, well, thank you for joining us tonight, everyone. One last quick note. Uh, we ask that our speakers for this weekend summit, as well as the event sponsors, meet us over by the Regency Room on uh, this end of the other side of the doors. Uh, for those of you who are here in the audience, we start things off with breakfast tomorrow at 8 a.m. and our first talk tomorrow at 9 a.m. and we're going all day. So we hope to see you then again, too. Take care. Have a good night.